Good morning, RCC. Nicole here. Can you believe it's Palm Sunday, which means Easter is next weekend? Holy cow, this uh, year is flying by. You know, being that Easter is next weekend, we would really like you to invite your friends and family to join us. Um, Easter is one of those days where if someone does not actually attend church regularly, that they are open to attending church. And it's one of the best and most important messages that they could hear. So please invite them, have them come Sunday, April 4th, even if it's just viewing on live stream. Yesterday was the prayer walk. I hope you were able to get out into your neighborhood and pray for your community. There's so much that we can be praying for and coming together in unity and prayer, whether it's, you know, this local community, whether it's for the state, the country, or even globally. But let's, let's continue um, praying together during these prayer walks. If you have not been baptized and you have an interest in being baptized, please sign up in the foyer. We'll reach out and contact you about it. But um, we would love we would love to baptize you and and let you make that declaration of your faith. Also, just want to thank you, RCC, as always, for your faithful giving, both your ties and your support of our mission, um, individuals, and just. I know I say the same thing every week, so I, so I feel like the words "thank you" just aren't enough, and I'm really searching for the words. And, and they're just, there aren't the right words because the way that this church body gives in faith each week, each month out of your resources, we can never thank you enough for that because the impact you're having is tremendous. So even though the words thank you may not be enough, I hope that all of you know how much we appreciate it and those that you're supporting appreciate it. We have a variety of ways that you can continue to give, whether it's online through the text app, you can mail it in, good old fashioned snail mail, or feel free to put it in the box at the back. Um, I'm just gonna pray for our church community. And if you'd bow your heads with me, that'd be great. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just lift up this church. I lift up this body. I lift up every single person, Lord. I lift up those outside of our church body who don't know you. And I just, I just pray that we extend our hands to them invite them to come to know you, Lord. And I just pray that you be at work in our hearts. I pray that you be at work in the hearts of our city, our local community, our state, Lord, and just in the hearts of this world. I just pray that you help us to be the hands and the feet and to bring others to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you all. Hope you have a great Sunday. I'm going to hand it back to everyone there. Hey, good morning, church. I don't even know what to do. There's a lot of people in here. Hey, let's all stand. Can we do that? Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. Who we cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us Like blazing wildfires Sing in your name Come on, sing that again Your love Oh, your love is Like radiant diamonds Bursting inside us who we cannot contain. Oh, your love will yeah, surely come find us. I blaze in wildfires. We're singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine. I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across the sky. Cause these hallelujahs be more just 
Can you lift your voices in praise this morning? We sing hallelujah to the King of Kings. It is Palm Sunday. This is the day we celebrate Jesus as King. Amen. Yes, God. Oh, and bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever lies before me, let me be singing with the heart. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Oh, I sing like this. Praise unending. Ten 
thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore, yeah, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name, so I'll sing like never Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, I worship his holy name. I sing, I sing like this. just with our voices, but from the depths of our hearts this morning, God. Yes, Lord. You know, one of my favorite parts about church is to hear you guys sing and worship. And so I'm going to ask the worship team, we're going to just back way down uh, this morning. Can we just sing Bless the Lord together? And bless the Lord, oh my Lord, we worship you this morning, Jesus. Thank you, God. Just to be in his presence, church. Just spend a few seconds in his presence this morning. See what you can do, oh God of wonders, your power has no end. Oh, the things you've done before in vain, oh, you will do again. Let's sing that one more time. We see what you can do, oh God of wonder, your power has to win. Oh, the things you've done before in greater measure, yes, but you will do again. There's no prayer. 
walls you can't break through, no mountains you can move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save, all things are possible. Come on, we got to sing that again. There's no prison walls you can't break through, no mountain you can't move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save, all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, and you've already won. Chosen victory, and now you're seated forever on the throne. So why should my heart fear what you've defeated? I will trust in you alone for the darkest already won, oh God of revival, come on, oh the darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, I let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already Come awake in your city, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble, I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awake in your people. Come awake in your city, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble, I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Come awake in your people. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the change. I hear the change. God of revival, pour it out, pour the darkest night. You can light it up. You can light it up. Let hope arise, death is overcome, and you've already won, oh God of revival, oh the darkest night, cause you can light it up, you can light it up.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. The greatest praise is hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to just come before thee, to worship you, to exalt you, to magnify your name, O Jehovah, and even to stand to say that, Lord, you are the God of revival. You are the God that breaks those chains. You are the God that restores. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, we have stood on your word as we have worshipped this morning. That, Lord, that whatever it is that is 
broken among us, O Jehovah, you will fix because you are God who can restore. I thank you, Father, because for the things that have died, Lord, during this week, Lord, as we celebrate Passover, as we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let there be life unto those things that had died. Lord, we pray that, Lord, for the faith that has been diminished, we ask that you restore it, O oh Master. We ask, O oh Father, for the hearts that are weeping, Lord, may you bring your comfort. May the Holy Spirit, our comforter, come and comfort us, O oh Father. Lord, as we sit at your feet this morning, we pray for those that are at home watching. May you all join in faith as we come together to hear the word of God and be restored and be encouraged and most of all, to have that relationship with God. Let revival begin within our hearts, within our spirits, within our souls, within our families and go on to the ends of the earth. I thank you, Father. I bless you. I pray that as we continue with this service, Holy Spirit of the living God, come and dwell among the praises of your people. We bless you, Lord. We give you honor and we give you all the majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Hey, it's Sunday school time for our kids, so uh, it's a great time to go See who's faster. See if, Mar Aunt, see if Marcy can, Pastor Marcy can beat you out there. I almost called her Aunt Marcy for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Not being prophetic or anything there, but. Hey, find somebody next to you and say hi. Hi, <laughs> Judy. All right, all right, all right. Stop having so much fun back there. Good morning. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, I want to first of all start off by um, just saying hi, saying hi to a couple of my buddies here in the room. So just to remind me, don't, don't mind me. But I want to give props to those who are sitting in the front row today. Because, you know, sitting in the front, like when I grew up, when I was introduced into church, I just thought the youth group sat in the far back corner and wrote notes and talked the whole service. I mean, because that's what I showed up to. I just thought that was normal. Until we had a youth pastor show up and said, you have two choices. You either go sit with your parents. Or you sit with me in the first two rows of church. So I really got used to that. But now when I go visit someplace, I want to sit as far away as possible. Come late, leave early. It's wonderful anyways. <laughs> but for those of you, and so we intentionally move in chairs around because we were one service, 10 a.m., and we're trying to get things around. And, and we wrestle with this because I know some of you at home watching, and you, it's just a weird time still, right? And so I know not all of us are super comfortable being in a room with people, You know, and so we're just going to figure this out as we go. And I just, we're just going to trust Jesus. And maybe we stay this way for a while, but maybe we have to go back to two services. If, what, what, <laughs> <laughs> hey, the best sound people and tech people are the quiet ones. Remember, remember, that's, the, that's our motto in the back. 
But yeah, I mean, they're, they're the tough ones. You know, they are here for a long time. But giving props, so uh, I'm giving props to those of you sitting in the front row. So a chocolate for you. They are. They, yeah, for the late. <laughs> so they basically said these are the props for the late people is what they just said. Oh, Udi, you're not in the front row, Udi. <laughs> All right. I cannot wait to get to heaven, and so I can talk and have a conversation with Udi. Because I've told her that I don't speak Punjabi, but she still talks to me anyways. And so I'm like, <laughs> anyway, it's just so precious. I love it. Hey, by the way, this is Valentine's candy for next Valentine's Day. I bought it early. Okay, I did not buy it early. Hey, we, uh, man, it is such a privilege for us to gather as a church. You know, and we're working on the grounds here and we're working on the parking seat stuff happening, right? But there might be a day that we cannot legally gather, right, in a building like this. And we may have to just huddle up somewhere and, and worship and pray. And so the fact that we can be together, I do not want us to take that for granted. It is a blessing from God that we could gather in his name. Yeah. And you guys worshiping this morning, I could have, I almost just blew off the sermon. Like, Let's just worship for another half an hour. Okay. Well, what are you saying there? Come on. I mean, that, you guys said yes fast. Okay. It'll happen. We're going to have some prayer and worship Sunday mornings um, as well, just like we do on Thursday nights. But we'll do that coming up. Hey, it is Passion Week this week where we celebrate where we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. And today is Palm Sunday, which is, to me, is such an incredible Sunday where Jesus came and rode humbly into Jerusalem on a donkey. Not this huge stallion, you know, but on a donkey, he humbly rode in. And they threw down palm branches and their jackets, and they worshiped him. That's what I want us to be. I want us to be like them. But what I don't want us to be is in less than a week, many in that same crowd would be persuaded to yell, crucify him. So this week is an amazing week for us to think through and remember if you're a believer in Jesus, just to be able to think through, man, Jesus, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do for me? And make it personal this week. Thursday is, is the Lord's Supper Day. Where Jesus was selling pass, celebrating Passover with his, his friends, his disciples. He washed their feet. And then he prayed these. We'll see it later on in John, probably 2023, when we get to <laughs> chapter 17. Um, when Jesus prays these, these prayers um, for his disciples. And then he prays them for us. That we would be faithful and that we would follow him that we would trust him, that we would put our hope in him. And then Friday, we call it Good Friday because <laughs> we're selfish humans, because it's good for us, but it's bad for him. That was a rough day. It was a rough day for him. Because if you really think what Jesus went through the last 24 hours of his life on planet Earth, before, I mean, we've already, we know the story, Right? So we know what happened, that he rose from the dead the third day, and there's excitement and celebration and awe and wonder, and then he was with us. And, but imagine being on that side, and you're, you're a rabbi, your teacher, your savior, your messiah, you just saw him crucified and buried. So Friday's a great day for us to kind of just contemplate. I know some of you get the day off, and it's just a great day to just at least spend a few minutes and just praising him and thanking him for what he went through. You know, the anxiety, the stress, 
I mean, I made a list. I just got to read it because I don't want to leave anything out. Anxiety, worry, the headache, stress, sadness, joy, betrayal. How do you throw joy in the middle of that? Pain, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Grief, loss, loneliness. But yet there's joy in the middle because the Bible says that for the joy set before him, that he knew that one day he'd be reunited with his Father in heaven. But he endured the cross for us. So Friday, Good Friday, is good for us. It's a time for us to think through and remember. We have a risen Savior, amen? amen. And that he lives and he, he breathes and he breathes life into us. And he didn't just leave us and abandon us, but he sent his Holy Spirit to guide us and correct us and to teach us every single day to comfort us. I mean, I need all those. C words, correction, comfort, care, more correction. <laughs> a little bit more comfort after I've been corrected. You know, yeah, I need all those things. Hey, we're going to be in John chapter 2 this morning. I encourage you to turn there with me. We have Bibles in the back. I can even give you page numbers if you have one of those, page 9, 12. I really encourage you to uh, open your Bibles with me this morning. I'm going to do some word association today, okay? A little word association. So I'm going to say something, and I want you just to, just to shout it out, okay? I'm going to point to you. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to point to you and give you a word, and Alex, you know you're going to be first. So I'm going to point to you, and I'm going to give you a word. Morgan, you're going to be second. And then I, after that, I don't know who I'm going to point to, okay? I'm just giving you a warning. And I'm just going to say, point to you and give you a word, and the first thing that comes to your mind. And I'm just trusting you at this point, okay? <laughs> Thanksgiving. Turkey. Turkey, okay, I like it. <laughs> Christmas. Okay, I like it. Prayer, Jody. Okay, Jesus. Okay, that's enough. The rest of you guys are like freaking out. I don't want to. Like, <laughs> I've never seen you guys pray so hard before. <laughs> that's how we're going to get you to pray from now on. Hey, we're going to just call on you randomly at church, and you guys are going to be the most holy people in the church right here. What's the first word? I want you, everybody here, think about it. You don't, I, but what's the first word you think of when I say Jesus? When I say the name Jesus, what is the first word that comes to mind? Savior, Savior what else? Peace, cross, forgiveness. What's that? Love, power, life. That's two words. Okay. Leave it to Janet to always go give that extra mile. I like it. I like it. I like it. Michael, you were saying something over here? Christ, yes. I noticed that nobody came up with zeal. Zeal, <laughs> yeah. John will edit that, so you'll be like, you'll be right there. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning, because that's one thing we don't always look at Jesus to have zeal. And zeal is just like this dedication. I mean, like serious dedication. It's like devotion, like I'm willing to do whatever, zeal. And we're going to read this passage that we're going to see a different side of Jesus that we never, like none of us said it. Like when I said, Jesus, no one, none of you said, tables. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, none of us, no, I didn't hear anybody say whips <laughs> or anger. But when we read this, and so, for some of us, it's kind of, it's interesting because we, like, I don't see Jesus as that way. I just see long hair and nice beard and 
he always talked soft. And when he looked at you, you're like, ooh. There's... And when we read this passage, we're going to see, we call it Passion Week. But we're going to see Jesus' passion and how serious he is about his Father in heaven. And then how serious he is and his zeal for you. Because in this passage, there are like blockades, there's hindrances, there's distractions for people who want to come and worship God. And Jesus, I think I can say this in church, gets really ticked off. I'm going to talk about that. Verse 17. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts where he found some people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all, the temp and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. And he scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Let's stop there. It's not really a typical day in Jerusalem. Because the crowds have come. Because it's Passover week. And if you... If you're familiar with Passover, Passover is a celebration that Jewish people celebrate their deliverance out of Egypt. They were there for 400 years as slaves. Started off really good with Joseph. Really good. And then it went really bad fast. And they were slaves for almost 400 years. And then God sent Moses. And you guys are familiar. So God sends Moses. And he delivers them out of Egypt. And just before, there's all these plagues. And one of them was the Passover. <laughs> where the angel of death came. And killed the firstborn of all. Unless you had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house. Some people say, I don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. The blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your house. Do you have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your house? So it's not a typical day in Jerusalem. It's crowded. It's full. It's big. It kind of reminds me, um, we're cruisers. We like to go on cruises when we go on vacation. We went up to Ketchikan. We did a family um, cruise from Seattle up to Ketchikan and a whole bunch of different places that you can't pronounce, but it was awesome. And we loved it. And you pull into some of these harbors. Like, Ketchikan is small. And you pull in, and there are seven gigantic cruise ships. Some of them are parked at the dock, but some of them are way out, and you, they have to get in the lifeboats and tender in back and forth. Yeah, there's seven massive cruise ships in this tiny little area. And Ketchikan is... Well, who's, I know some people from Ketchikan. Um, Ketchikan is just crawling with people. And, if you, and you go there, and a little side note, you know, it's crazy. Like, when you're on the cruise ship, all you can eat, 24 hours a day. It's Ben's favorite place in the world. <laughs> Restaurants galore. As much as you want. We took some youth on a, one of our guys in less than 24 hours had like seven ice cream cones. You know, it's crazy because it's free ice cream. Why not, right? And so, crazy. <laughs> Jerusalem is crawling with people. And what happens is, because man's heart is so good. <laughs> hey, I got an opportunity here. I can make some money here. You know, get your t-shirts, get your, you know, yeah, programs. But in the temple, many of them were coming to Jerusalem for their once-a-year sacrifice. And they come from a long ways away. You're not going to bring your sacrifice. A lot of them can't, couldn't bring their sacrifice, so they would have to buy the lamb. Buy the, 
the cattle, the cow, the bull, the ram, the doves. You know, God always takes care of us. What if I can't afford? Well, everybody back then can afford a dove. And God said, that's acceptable in my sight. And so these merchants said, I have an opportunity here. I can raise my prices. It's like when you go to the movies. Six bucks for that thing? I can buy it at Walmart for 98 cents. It's exactly the same. Except for they were putting a hindrance, a blockade, a distraction in front of God's people. They were ripping off God's people. They were coming to worship their God. And they know that because the way God set it up, sacrifice had to happen. And so they're being ripped off. Money changers, because the way God set it up back in Exodus 30, when you came into the temple, you gave your offering. Rich or poor gave the same. It was a half a shekel. And it had to be Jewish money, but they're all walking around with Roman coins, denarius, in their pockets. So they had to exchange. I give you a quarter, and you give me a quarter back. Is that how they did it? No, you give me five bucks. And I'll give you a quarter back. I can't afford five bucks. Then you can't come in and worship God. That's what's happening. And Jesus comes in and he goes off. Now, a side of Jesus that we don't always see, and it's almost sometimes you're like, whoa, I don't know if I want to see that side of Jesus. But it's there because it's his passion. For his father in heaven. And it's his passion and zeal for you. To be able to connect with God. To be with him. To spend time with him. No obstructions. Nothing blocking your way. You want to come to God. You come. And what's so cool. As we look at the Passion Week. One of the amazing things. That when Jesus died on the cross. A lot of things happened. You guys realize it was earthquakes. You guys realize that when Jesus died on the cross, people were being risen from the dead? Because heaven opened up, and the temple where people had come to worship, there is this huge, like 18 inch thick, I mean, that's like that cloth, veil, curtain that separated the inner court to the Holy of Holies. No one went in there because that's where God was. See, the temple was a sacred place. It was a holy place. It was a place that was set apart because God was there. And only the high priest would go in once a year. Well, our high priest, as Hebrews describes, Jesus, he tore that veil. So when he died on the cross, church, the Bible says that the veil tore from top to bottom. And the Holy of Holies was completely exposed, and we were able to enter in because of what Jesus did. That's how passionate he is for us. That's how how much zeal he has for us. And so he goes off here, and he makes a whip. Now, there's a couple accounts of Jesus clearing the temple. In the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus does it right after the triumphant entry, right after Palm Sunday. He's ushered into Jerusalem on a donkey. They are worshiping him, and he goes in and he cleans the temple. But this is the first time. He does it twice, the very beginning of his ministry and right before he goes to the cross. And we see that Jesus, it says that he fashioned a whip. Now, I went to the store actually yesterday, and I was practicing whips. And they were kind of, they weren't, they weren't very good. It wasn't loud. I wanted to get a whip and like loud. I mean, loud. Have you ever, I mean, I can see Indiana Jones breaking out the whip and wearing the hat. It was hard for me to picture Jesus, but Jesus grabs a whip and starts Scattering people around. He's like pushing over to... I, I've always wanted to do that. 
you know, a table that's set up nice, has coins all over it. You just walk up and you just, how, how much fun would that be? You know, there's a place in Seattle that you can go and you can pay money to like smash things. To, it's called the break room. They give you like a baseball bat and all kinds of stuff. And you just go in there and have your way with windows and bottles and lamps. And they charge you money to do that. They're all over the place. Wow, people are angry. You know, I kind of always wanted to walk into a place like that and do that. Well, I think part of the thing for us, when we see Jesus' way, because we cannot separate anger and sin. I think that's one of the biggest things. Because I have an anger. Very seldom is it righteous anger. You cut me off. Yeah, right? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> you know? It's very seldom is it a righteous anger. But there have been a few times where God would just put it on our hearts and then all of a sudden something rises up inside of us. And, and maybe it's situations that we see in our culture, in our, in our world, in our country right now, and we kind of get... Because the Bible says that we can have anger, but yet not, we, we don't sin. Because it's a, it's a righteous... It's a zeal, like, I am so passionate about this. It's a tough line. We've talked about lines last week. This is a tough one. Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He did this. He's driving people out, flipping over tables, and yet without sin. Don't recommend you doing it. You'll probably be arrested. But what a testimony you'd be setting in there. Sharing with the fellow inmates about your, your zeal for the Lord. So that's what's happening. It's, it's crazy. I can imagine his disciples, you know, he had some, his disciples, his followers were there. Have you ever seen somebody just completely flip out and then it's the awkward silence? You're like... I don't know if I should say something here. Um, like, hey, Jesus, are you, are you okay? <laughs> you know, I'm fine, leave me alone. That's my response. That would have been a great conversation to have with Jesus right after this happened. Because his passion and his zeal for people to be able to have access to God. Remember, the temple was a place that was sacred. The temple was a place that was holy and set apart. The temple was being used as a marketplace for people to rip people off. And it was also being used as just an everyday shortcut. Because the way the temple was situated in the city, there's highways, roads on each side of it. But you had gates in the temple. And like, man, I could save myself 15 minutes if I just go in this one door and then just walk straight across the courtyards. And so they're like carrying their boxes and... You know, it doesn't say shepherds, but it says merchants were carrying boxes and going through. When we see the other, the other account, this is just a normal thing. That the temple was no longer sacred or holy. It was something that was convenient. There was like, when you go into a place that is holy, that is set apart, there should be like something heartfelt about it. And it had become like, this is just a shortcut for me. Maybe the first few times you're kind of going through and like, wow, this is amazing. God, thank you for today as you're carrying your boxes to make it as a shortcut. But then after a while, you don't even think about it. You just walk right on through. No heart change. Nothing moves you. You're just busy. I need to get to the other thing on the other side. Man, don't we treat church that way sometimes, though? Ah, oh, it's convenient. I'm just going to pass through. Not really heartfelt. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do so I can get to the other thing on the other side. 
And Jesus is saying, you need to stop. And you need to acknowledge me. That's what the temple was about. It was a place where you can come and you can connect with God. And I know the church is not a building. That if we had to huddle under the trees out there, we could connect with God with, with one another and with one another, right? Well, there was trees out there. <clears throat> Talk to me later. I'll tell you what's going on. But man, I just really felt myself, I stopped and looked and said, man, do I treat church this way? Am I just looking for what's coming after and what's next in my day and just putting my time in? It's real easy to do, right? I mean, there's a great golf thing happening on, later on today. And is there a NASCAR race today? Maybe. <laughs> Right? You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on, right? But man, when we gather as the church, I want it to be heartfelt. Yeah, convenient, sure, one service. But I want it to be heartfelt that when we're here, we acknowledge him and that he shows up in our midst. And he does because he's so faithful. Well, Jesus clears his temple out and he goes for it. And we still ask the question, how do I deal with this anger? Because I'll just be real. A lot of us have anger issues. Right? Can we have a real moment? Yeah, we have anger issues. So turn to Ephesians. Let's read a passage together. I'm going to read a long passage for you. I mean, I like plucking verses. But there's times where you say, I, we just got to read the whole context and that could be the sermon of just reading the word. But Jesus was angry and yet did not sin. And Paul talks about that here in Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to start off with verse 17 in there as well. And I was just going to read you one verse. I was going to read you verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. But I want to read it to you, that, to you in the whole context. These are like Paul's instructions on how we are to live. Some of us as believers, we ask the question, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, here we go. Here's some of the things that we're supposed to be doing. Verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17, Ephesians 4. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. That you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, those who don't look to God at all. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life God has because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, as so to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed." It sounds familiar, church. That who, however, is not the way, that however, is not the way you are to live life or that what you've learned. When you heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude and in your minds. And to put on the new self. Created to be like God in his true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we all are members of one body. In your anger. Because God knows that we will be angry. Do not Sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. By the way, couples in this room, that is a great verse for you to memorize together. My wife's in the room somewhere. Cleo, raise your hand. Hey, there you are. Good morning. 
we have made this commitment 34 and a half years ago. Now, there have been a few times we've been up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm not joking. Because I was like, all right, I cannot go to bed angry. In your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. The Bible is so practical, people. And they may have some, so that they may have something to share with those who are in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I memorized this verse when I was about 15 years old because my mouth, whoo. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. That'll preach. And I want to read that whole passage to you because the Word of God has much to say to us. And I really would challenge you, and I'm speaking to myself when I watch this again, which camera should I look at, Eric? Uh, that one. This one here? Yeah. So I challenge you to read your Bible more. I'm serious. I watch way too much TV. I do. I need to read my Bible more. I need to spend more time with him. Because when we read these passages, it's life changing. It reminds us who we are. It reminds us what we're here for. That Oh, I'm not here just for myself, but I'm here for others. That I might be able to share with people who are in need. And when I do that, what it does is it points people who are in need to the God who meets my need. And we see people get saved and rescued. And we see what we sing about. Those chains are broken. And people's lives are restored when we serve him with a whole heart. That's why Jesus was so passionate about clearing the temple and says, I want these things out of here. Because this is a holy place. Jews don't quite understand it. They, they question them. They are, they are a group of people who are looking for signs. They're the show me generation. By the way, that generation is back. But then I would challenge us also then, okay, so they're the show me generation. Then we as a church better show them who our God is by what we do. Not that we would slander and that we'd, we'd fight and we'd get together. Some of the worst fights are in church, believe it or not. Not in this church. You guys are amazing. They say when you go find a church, when you join a church, go to their business meeting and check them out. That's why we don't have business meetings. <laughs> Good job, Alex and Pam. <laughs> they set the foundation. We're not doing that here. I do remember, though, we did have one when we first started coming. So I took the advice and I showed up. And it was the biggest. I mean, they did, you guys always... But remember when the big argument about air conditioning? Woo-wee! Man, people were angry about spending money to put air conditioning in here. But then they liked it afterwards. You know. Anyways. Man, they didn't understand it. It was a show me generation. So they said, hey, give us a sign. You need to show us. And Jesus had already been doing a whole bunch of stuff. Well, show us one more thing. But man... I point my finger at these people all the time, but I'm the same exact way. God just did something to me. God, show me more. Do something else. Show me more. So they said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, okay, destroy this temple, and then I will rebuild it 
in three days. And they're like, oh, come on. It took 46 years to build this place. We're still under construction. It's the longest running TV show, home show, whatever they call HD, home, whatever they are, channel, show. <laughs> Build this temple with Bob Bila, whatever it is, okay, <laughs> right? You know, and yeah, and they're like, are you serious? Destroy this temple and you'll rebuild it in three days? Kind of like what Dana said a few weeks ago, just miss. I mean, just not even in the ballpark. And what Jesus, prophetically, Jesus is saying, destroy me. And I will raise again in three days. If you read the rest of that passage, they just don't get it. But his disciples get it. They don't get it right there, but they get it after Jesus raises from the dead. And they're like, ooh, I know what he was doing back there. He was prophetically saying that they're going to destroy him, and he will rise from the dead in three days. I mean, Jesus was doing all kinds of incredible things and continued to even after this. So much so that the people who could come to him, they wanted to make him king. That was always in their hearts. Deliver us from our enemy. Be our king. But if you read the rest of John chapter 2, it's one of those unique passages. And it says, Jesus did not entrust himself to them. What? I mean, God, don't you want all of us to like, follow you and trust you and put our hopes in you? Yes, he does. But not in the temporary not like, God, if you get me out of this pickle, then I will. Anybody ever pray that prayer? And then how quickly we forget. Jesus didn't trust him, himself with them because they wanted a, something temporary. They wanted him to be king now. They wanted him to deliver them from the Romans now. But we know that Jesus is not king, only king of this earth, but he is the king of the universe that we're a part of. Is Jesus king? Yes, but he's the king of it all. Does Jesus deliver us from the enemy? Yes, not just this enemy that we see, but the unseen enemy who we call the devil. The principalities and powers have been defeated because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And that is exactly what John chapter 2 is talking about. And so for me, like as I read this passage and I sat there and I studied and I was just sitting there thinking through and I was like, so the temple is supposed to be a holy place, a sacred place, a place that is set apart and set aside, a place where God is. Can I read you a passage? In 1 Corinthians 9, 6, 19 and 20, Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are, listen, temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Don't, don't you realize this? You are not your own. If you are a follower of Jesus in this room, watching from home or whenever, you are not your own. Some of you might say, well, I just want to do what I want to do. Well, too bad. You're a follower of Jesus. You are not your own because you've been purchased with a price. And that price is his blood. That he laid his life down for you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And so Paul says, so then you honor God with your bodies. Honor him in the things that you do. Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. You guys hear that? It's no longer that I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. My life is now alive in the body, yeah. But I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
So I read this passage about Jesus clearing the temple, and I start thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the temple now? And I was like, okay, I'm not going there. Jesus' zeal for you is the same today as it was then. His passion for God is the same back then as it is today. And he wants to clear the temple. Those places where we have hindrance, those places that we are being ripped off, those places that we have, are ripping ourselves off. <laughs> Jesus wants to clear those things out. And he wants us to remind us that just like the temple that was a stationary place that was a place that was holy, set apart, and sacred, Jesus wants to remind us today that as his temples, that you are holy that you are set apart and that you are sacred and that God dwells in you. And so what I've asked Ken to do is play some soft music, really soft for a moment or two this morning. We're still looking for more worship team volunteers. So we're, so we're going to just play some YouTube This is what I want to encourage you this morning. In church, I'm talking to myself too. Revival happens. That song we sang this morning, brand new song. Revival happens is when, when people, the people of God clear the temple. No longer about convenience. It's not just passing through. No more hindrances, blockages, distractions. It's knowing that it's all about Him. And on that Good Friday, He made it about you. That's his passion, and that's his zeal. Revival happens when the people of God get right with God. And then people see. And they're like, I want what they have. Because that's real. Some of the stuff that we walk around with is not real. And our non-Christian friends are like, why would I want that? Because I see you. Now, I want you to remember this morning, there's, there's no con if you're a follower of Jesus, there is no condemnation in Christ. Listen to me. There is no condemnation in him. I'm going to do this so I don't fall off. But there, is, but there is conviction. And there is correction. Because he cares for you. And he knows that we're ripping ourselves off. Now, we're here for a moment, the book of James says. It's like a mist. Psh, and we're gone. So let's take this time while we're here and say, God, all right. You say that I'm your temple that you live here. So then I want to be set apart. I want to live my life holy and be sacred and honor you in the things that I do with my words, with my thoughts, with my actions. Hey, we're in this together. I'm not, I'm just here. It's going to drive the camera people crazy, but we're on the same level, church. I just happen to have a microphone strapped to my face. 
We're all sinners in this room, saved by grace. Saved by grace. Jesus doesn't want us to be stuck. Sin causes us to be stuck. Sin separates our hearts from his. It's time to clean the temple out. And in Jesus' name, get out of here, is what he said. Get these things out of here, because I want to communicate and spend time with you. And you'll never be the same. So maybe there's some things in your life, and it's just, they're there. You see them. I have them. I've already confessed them this morning, because I knew what was going to be talked about. (laughs) Trust me, I've been confessing all week. But his grace is here for us. And he corrects us because he loves us. I mean, we're his kids. If my kid was running around Petrovsky, out in the middle of the road, what would I do? Ah, you're okay. No, I would say, no, I'm not doing that to him. I'm, that was a car hitting him. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. But he corrects us, like, get out of the road. You're going to hurt yourself. Don't touch that because it's hot and you'll burn yourself. Ouch. We do it every time. But there's healing and there's grace. Man, maybe you've really messed up. There's no condemnation in him. There's grace with him. There's correction and there's comfort and there's care, but you got to go to him. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Can you spend a few moments? I just trust that the Holy Spirit right now is sweeping through. He's sweeping through. Get these things out of here, he says. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God, that you never stop working. Thank you, God, that you are the way maker, that you are the promise keeper, that you are light in the darkness. Thank you that you speak prophetically even this morning, and you're saying, get these things out of here. And so you can have true fellowship with me. No hindrances, no blockades, no distractions. You are holy, sacred, and set apart if you are a follower of me, Jesus says. I do want to encourage you. Not to do this alone. That you would find somebody that you love and that you know loves you that you can share with and walk with as he clears the temple. Accountability is good. Accountability is good. Jesus, thank you for this morning. God, Lord, I thank you for our Sunday school teachers, our preschool workers who are going long today because of what you're doing here. We thank you that for their servants' hearts. I pray for our kids this morning. Lord, that they, as they grow up, Jesus, that they wouldn't have to clear out so much stuff because you are already working in them now. For the rest of us, God, Thank you that you gently, (laughs) with a whip and turning over tables, but you gently convict, correct, but you do it with care 
and compassion. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin, that you are faithful and just to wash us and to make us clean when we're honest with you and we share. We thank you for this week, Passion Week, and we ask Jesus that we each take time to remember the things that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Blessings to your church. Next week is Resurrection Sunday. Looking forward to uh, celebrating Jesus with you. Amen? Amen. amen.